Hello again, folks, and welcome to another episode of Drumming Up Conversation. Well, we're in for a treat again tonight. Um, on episode two, we have a young gentleman from the same island as me. Yes, the UK has four countries built into it, or is it five? I don't remember. I'm rubbish at maths. I can only count to four. I'm a drummer. Simon, how are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks, David. Thanks for uh, yeah, thanks for having me on here today. Much appreciated. No worries at all. And I said just we're, we're a good chat, guys. Um, just before. We, we hit the record button and Simon and I have got quite a few things in common apart from the hair thing Simon's got more <laughs> hair and better hair than me and we've also got this like, same colour top as you now this is actually black what colour is your top? Oh, this is actually blue it's kind of like a royal ah, blue right, okay so, so it must be the light in this place that's um it's playing a bit of my colour so yes <laughs> so we've been we've been chatting for the last three or four weeks on Instagram haven't we <clears throat> and yeah, online yeah yeah um and just life gets in the way and we finally secured just now to have a, a chat for a wee while all things drum be, drummy and life and everything in, in between kind of thing you know so give me your kind of backstory Simon like why why and how did you did you get into drumming cool um so I got into drumming uh, probably when I was about 10. Mm-hmm. So I'm 43 now. So it was a long time ago. Um, so my dad was a drummer. Um, okay. Well, he's a drummer, but uh, he played when he was a kid. There was a, a, a his old kit in in a in one of our rooms where we grew up. Oh, wow. Um, and my older brother would play, uh, would play drums, and I'd sort okay. of listen in, and my dad would occasionally play. I was just like, oh, that sounds cool. Uh, and we quite we were a very musical household, so like mum and dad always had music on. So I was always listening to stuff like Genesis, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and you know, lots of Michael Jackson, lots of other pop, a few other rock bands here and there. Um, and my brother was into guitar, and it was just like the instrument was there, and I was just drawn to it, and and just got into it from there, really. Uh, and then yeah, school bands all sorts of different bands to uh, quite a serious band when I moved to London in my oh, mid-20s wow. to, you know, the odd tour here and there to lots of studio stuff. Wow. Did you ever come um, up to Scotland? On the tour? You know what? We absolutely love Scotland. See? Uh, Thank you. Thank like uh, places like, uh, where is it? Uh, Tomerton? Uh, Perth? Oh, like Tom and, Tom and Tool, which is currently six foot of snow at the moment yeah oh wow there you but go yeah, yeah we yeah. yeah uh inverness oh wow um, never made it to edinburgh unfortunately right. hey, glasgow's we played is it king tut's king um, tut's wow hut in glasgow yeah wow yeah, that's a that great was, venue that that's was a great incredible venue. venue but the um oh where was the place where we i think it was in perth where okay. we were made to feel so welcome when we, yeah. we turned up there uh one mm-hmm. of the one of the venues just yeah we absolutely like we we had a a very welcoming experience a couple of times we toured and, and headed okay. up to Scotland. It's great fun. Love we're a great it. bunch. We're a great bunch, contrary to public belief. We're a very good uh, bunch. Yeah, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> Honestly, we were looked after so well. Like yeah. we were just like, yeah, come and party with us, or like, you know, we'll get the crowd going and just yeah. get you fed and drink and all that stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we we were really fun. We had some amazing experiences, real fond memories. Like oh real fantastic. Fun. So that was so you're in your 20s. So you and I I'm 42, you're 43, so in about 20, 15, 20 years ago, kind of thing, I'm rubbish at my yeah, 20 plus yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so so I kind of got into a serious band probably in, what was it, I think we were around from like 2006 to 2009, Great. Um, just playing like kind of heavy, heavy rock, um, but sort of synth-based, we were three-piece, so oh, wow. it was great, great fun, um, kind of heavy heavy drumming but not like super technical um all about kind of groove maybe inspired by like bonham style yeah uh we were compared to like bands like muse uh, oh, wow. but we were influenced we were influenced by so many different artists so yeah. our sound was it was a real mashup of like dance music to to stuff like muse to like um old school metal uh to I don't know. We can never quite pinpoint, and people could never quite position us. We'd we we'd either play with uh, metal bands or hard rock bands, or like right. the indie scene, and we were never quite. Yeah, yeah. We were somewhere between. Um, 
but yeah, we, I mean, the, the pinnacle was we played Download Festival in 2009. That was wow. an utterly mind blowing experience. So, um, is that the one that's uh, Reading and Leeds, or is that completely different? Ah, so, so it's, it's, it's different to Reading and Leeds. Um, right. So, it's by Donington Castle. Um, oh, of course, that's right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, which was, yeah, we we were very fortunate to play there. We, we that's opened amazing. up the sort of third stage out of the four of them. Um, okay. But it was wild. Like we got like the backstage passes and we're walking around. The full VIP. Like, it was like, what's that guy from that band? What's him over there? Like, or her wow. over there. It's so cool. Um, so I was just like, I uh, just like smiling the whole time. Going, Absolutely. I can't actually Loving life. It. Yeah. But we, yeah, we did, we did the performance and, you know, it was the biggest rig we've ever played on. Uh, right. A drum sounded, well, I mean, I used someone else's kit and just mm-hmm. brought my, I think it was just cymbals, sticks and snare or whatever. But, but having it go through the sound system on this absolutely huge yeah. stage was just, it was mind boggling. Yeah. Um, Did you have wedges or were you listening to in ears or? Uh, I Yeah, in, in ears and monitors, I think. Because right. I because I would play to a click at that right. point. Um, we'd have a few, we have a few backing tracks going on. I think at that point we got rid of backing tracks and our right. keyboard player, he was incredible musician uh who was very adept at playing both the bass synth lines plus melody oh wow on his right hand so he had two two machines going on at the same time wow, he's kind of like a drummer but on a keyboard yeah, <laughs> so yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he had four different things going on at once uh, wow. plus and, uh, yeah and who so says men all... can multitask that's a great <laughs> that's example it. It. We, we we can we can <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, it was all over within about 30 minutes and it was like, oh, wow, we've done it. Can't believe yeah. it. Uh, and we did a few other sort of smaller festivals around London. Um, right. And just, yeah, played, played some different different venues in our career across the mm-hmm. UK. That's um, amazing. But the, the beauty of it was, while it was hard work and we, you know, we all had day jobs, but we were practicing um, uh, two evenings a week for four hours plus all day Saturday oh, like every geez, week like getting a lot. You know, practice 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 and we we were solid like we've become so tight and it's yeah. the best point I think in my drumming career that I got to mm-hmm. because we were so practiced and it really was just about practice constant yeah. repetition um and and when we would go on tour that's when we become the tightest and, yeah. and maybe it was just because we were so in sync and and my drum my drumming had become not not robotic but more like I knew what I had to do every time I would perform yeah. that I was at that sweet spot of um, I'm concentrating, but not over concentrating where I make mistakes, but I'm not laid back that I don't, that I then make mistakes. I think there's that real sweet spot when it comes to absolutely. You're, you're that well rehearsed that um, you, you actually allow, allow for a bit of, you know, there's a gap coming up and usually, oh, I usually play this film. But, mm, <laughs> Will I tonight play a different film or yeah, something absolutely. differently? You know, it's it could be dangerous that way, but hey, music yeah. is dangerous at times. And, so. and yeah, absolutely. And and I remember um, on certain stuff that we had on record, I'd end up then sort of changing the beat slightly for for the live performance, so yeah. just just to keep it fresh. And mm. and the band would get to know the change in the fills. It wasn't yeah. like I just like surprise them where the guitar is something in. <laughs> it's like I, I I think in my early career as a drummer I'd try and do all the showy stuff. But oh, yeah. the older I've got, I'm all like yeah. just like keep it steady at the back, have a little bit of flair when it's appropriate. Yeah. But just keep it steady and keep keep that crowd um into it by you know help supporting the the front person to do their thing and get mm-hmm. the crowd going. But if if at the back it ain't solid, then there's no hope. Then you'd probably be in a video with the, the drummer at their own gig kind of thing, you know. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> it. But 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 that was I mean that was the that's totally what I would. That's why I love gigging at that point. I mean yeah. I was much younger and in much better shape. Mm-hmm. But the vibe from the audience was just magic. I don't. I've never been able to describe it to anyone who is a non musician, like someone who hasn't performed. But yeah. there's a, a sense of connection you have with the audience like it just feeds you and then then you your performance changes and then the audience buzzes off that and it becomes yeah. a sort of cycle of it's just you can't you can't touch it you can't describe it it's just yeah a weird chemical reaction um uh, maybe there is some science to it i'm sure there is maybe some oxytocin going on or whatever but it, it, it it's a it's a magical experience to 
to have that performance and to get that feedback from an audience and then you Absolutely. give it back more and they give it back more it's, it's pretty special so you mentioned that when you're getting when you're being brought up and being brought up um <laughs> that you there was always music on in the background from genesis and when you started playing live with the band that you'd mentioned uh, coming to scotland you played like so or kind of muse kind of style Mm. Did you adopt any drummers' techniques or steal any of their riffs or any of their licks or anything yeah, like that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My the way I've learned to drum, I've never had a lesson. I've mm. always been self-taught. Um, oh really? Uh, yeah, wow. yeah, absolutely. No less no lessons, just purely self-taught. I like your technique as well. I've watched a few of the videos on Instagram. Oh, and oh, honestly, wow. you're I spoke about it in one of the reaction videos this morning that I did. Been at five o'clock to make folks, um, and your posture, your posture is is very because you you are you tall? You look quite tall. I am tall, yeah, six yeah, two, yeah, six yeah. two. There you go. So, and your posture is very. High. Look at uh, Mick Fleetwood, for example. Ah, yeah, there, yeah, he's, yeah, he's never point. really. Well, he's I think he's got more hunched in time as he's gotten older, yeah. but um, he's not got a, a high kit, as it were. It's not raised mm. heavily, kind of from a. You know, and looking at your kick, I've seen you play on that on your videos and also behind you just now, that your posture is, is great. It's very, very good. And there's a whole amazing videos on YouTube about biomechanics oh, and the best sitting position and um, stick position for your for your size kit and all this kind of jazz. And it's a whole ergonomics is it just blows my mind. It's it's. It's fascinating. Yeah. But yeah, your posture is brilliant. Just thought I'd oh, chuck that you. in there. Well done, you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Like, from I, someone who's I'm got ne- shit posture. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, I do suffer from back problems. So right. so maybe I'm consciously aware of it because yeah. of kind of what I've had to learn through trying to improve my posture and my back problems, which has been which has come from lugging around kits <laughs> for a lot Absolutely, of my life. Yeah. Totally trash my back. Um so so I yeah, I mean self-taught and the music I was listening to in my teens was like all the kind of pop punky stuff. So Green Day, Weezer, Foo yeah. Fighters, Nirvana, yeah, yeah, Pearl Jam, yeah. Soundgarden. So I was just mimicking, you know, I was mimicking Grohl, trying my best to. Yeah. Uh, you it's know, Matt Cameron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Matt Cameron from Soundgarden was a big influence. Yeah. I also got really into the police at that point. So I guess Copeland had a quite ah, influence right, on me. Okay. Um, just the sort of subtlety of his flair, I was always excited by. That, that certainly that ability Taylor, to Taylor Hawkins. He uh, he spoke. Ah, yes, um, yeah, a few right. things about about Stuart Copeland. How he that was one of his. I mean, Roger Taylor from Queen was one of his. You know, I think everybody around our age, yeah, you know, brought up in the eighties and also yeah, in the nineties yeah. music as well. The police were always around, so so Copeland was always was always kicking around and. Yeah, he's he's quite a straight player, very similar to the drummer in the Stones. Very very straight player. He'll chuck a fill in every once in a while, but nothing too. Yeah, he'll not over over spill it as we touched on earlier on. Yeah, just, yeah. The, the night best bit of varnish on the nail, as it were, as 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 possible. Can kind of, rather than over over playing. Absolutely, I think, yeah. and, and I and I guess you know that kind of. The variety of the music that I was listening to, I guess, in my teens and early twenties, it was a bit close, a bit more closed. But you know, as I've got older, I'm listening to a lot of diverse music now, and that's yeah. had a real influence. So, kind of got well into, um, kind of obsessed with session drummers and how they had such an influence on the whole wave of genres. So, like, I remember in the mid, I remember. Uh, it was a drum shop. So I grew up in Bournemouth. That was right. my hometown right. on, the, on the southern coast of England. And this drum shop that I'd always get my stuff from, I'd always, you know, speak to the, the person who ran it. And I'd say, like, you know, can you can you do some good drummers to check out that I might not know about? And he's like, yeah. oh, he's check out this drummer called Steve Gadd. Um, <laughs> he's quite good. I was like, all right, never heard good. of him. He goes, he goes, you probably have never heard of him, but you've probably heard him on a lot of tracks. And I was like, early 20s, like, okay. So I just, you know, became obsessed with Gad and, you know, his groove is so unique. Yeah. And now, now when I listen to some tracks and they're from the 70s or 80s, I'm like, I bet that's Gad. Go on Discogs and go, yep, that's Steve Gad. Yep, <laughs> so, that's so, it, yeah. so, so clear and obvious once you, once you, you know, once you get his sound and his style. Uh, same with Jeff Pecoro. Um with Toto and the way you play with Steely Dan and it's just utterly mesmerizing. Um, yeah. 
and and I notice Bokoro more now, like I do with Gad. And yeah, even even the other day, I was like, "Is this? Oh, this can't be Jeff." And I was like, "It's Jeff Bokoro," and he's like yeah. drumming on like an Aretha Franklin album. I'm just like, yeah. "It's just amazing." Yeah. You, um, so you these always... heroes of how they did it, and you know John J R Robinson and yeah, his work with Jackson and and all of the Quincy Jones stuff. I'm like. They were so relentless, like. But you knew why they hired them because they were so because on it. Were, yes, <laughs> so on it. You always know if you listen to a track and on Spotify or whatever, and on other um, music <laughs> listening uh, things. Um, John Bonham, for example, mm, had yeah, a random yeah. thing on a listening channel, whatever it's called, uh, the other day, and um, is that Bonham? It doesn't sound as heavy as X or Y. It must be born, and it was born. I'm just as thunderous. She yeah. was. Like, how yeah. exhausting uh, is that? I, 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 it, Bonham. Yeah. I, just, I often sort of see Bonham as like. I don't know. I try and I try and see some drummers on a scale sometimes, and right. and one scale might be, or the scale could be like absolutely dead strict completely on the money technically incredible so let's take um neil pert from rush right oh wow so unbelievably strict and on time like like a like a it just sounds like a drum machine he is <laughs> so a metronome like, he is it's a just machine. so on it like wow. i think i'm sure if uh, maybe there are videos already out there that if someone did a study <laughs> against a track and it's like yep he's playing on it every time oh, so there's man. like the perts and then i would say there's like um i don't know let's go for um some sort of i don't know uh not chas chandler uh who was the mitch mitchell from Maybe. who played with Jimi hendrix that's right yes uh, who was so he kind of not so tight yeah so real loose but really ferocious and full of flair and creativity yeah. and absolutely amazing maybe keith moon's in that category as mm. well like utterly utterly incredible mm. drummer yeah, so loose and free. I see Bonham as the middle. Like he had the, yeah, the yeah. technical proficiency of just being utterly, oh my goodness, he's so tight. Yeah. Yet that, oh my goodness, he also has all that incredible flair and pe- performative si- side of, of how he drums with the other, you know, performs yeah. with the other musicians. So there's like, yeah, there's something about Bonham. I think he's completely untouchable They're in that sweet spot of totally keeping time to letting loose creative beauty just behind or just forward of the beat, but it still sounds great. Yeah. It's something, it's something that I, I don't think any drummer other than perhaps uh, John's John Bonham's son has ever recreated. Yeah. And it's people often touch on guitarists, how the guitarists have got their sound because their guitar sounds a certain way or different, certain pickup setting or mm. they're homemade or whatnot. Drummers have the exact same. They have yeah, their own is- they have their own signature. There's a, there's a pun as well. They have their own, yeah. their own signature, their own kind of way of telling telling that story. You know, yeah. telling that that next story. Same with yeah, same with Phil Collins. Like you hear you hear Phil Collins playing, you're like, that's Phil Collins. It's definitely Phil Collins. Like it's, it's yeah. a, you know, you get to that stage where you even if you're like, oh, it's him drumming on another person's. Oh, it's Collins. Wow, that's cool. I still think it's fascinating, and this 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 isn't left handist. I always find it fascinating watching a left handed drummer. They blow me yeah. away. Yeah. Yeah, like my, yeah. my, my son, who is nine, he's got a drum kit to himself. Yeah, um, so my son, he's nine years old, and he's got his mm-hmm. own own drum kit. Um, not here; it's at my parents' house because that's where my drum kit is. Because my house is far too small, and he's left handed. So I remember oh. setting it up for him. I thought, oh, set it up. I had a wee shot. I thought, oh god, it's the wrong way around, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which there's no right or wrong way around folks yeah, just kidding exactly that don't blame yeah. me don't, don't go yeah. mental at me um but it's but it, i guess that cognitive wow. switch to kind of play like oh i'm going this way round, and i'm i'm crossing over that way or, yeah. or maybe i'm not and yeah, yeah. it's I, i've i don't think i've ever tried a left-handed kid to be honest but well be an, an interesting experience some drummers who are left-handed but play open-handed Yes, so that the yeah, hi hat yeah. is to the left hand side as yeah, per a, as yeah. per a, a right handed drummer. We okay. spoke about bands that you listen to and all that kind of jazz growing up, and what you listened to through the eighties and nineties and 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 
until now. And then we'll get on to gear in a little while. Um, mm. But I want to get on to the subject of why, I guess, did you uh, get into the drumming? I guess, I mean, I've, I've never been good at sports. So maybe I was like subconsciously looking for something that I could get good at. Mm. And I, and I, and for some reason, um, I, I don't know, I don't want to sound arrogant, but as a kid, I naturally just got good at drumming at quite a young age and, and people would comment on it. Like my folks are really encouraging. Uh, my brothers were like, you're really good. And you're only 11. Like, how wow. are you doing that? So it was, you know, and I was like, oh, well, I'm not doing this with lessons. So there must be something in this that I'm just mm-hmm. kind of listening to music or listening to a drummer and trying to recreate what they do and playing along with my tape player and uh, headphones, <laughs> trying to copy what they do and stuff like that. Um, maybe that was just it it was just like oh wow can i can i'm actually i can do something like i'm not good at sports or i'm you know, i was doing all right at school yeah. but i wasn't really my i wasn't academic i wasn't like excited about education or yeah, no. becoming anything it was more like i love music i love playing this i love i'm obsessed with you know even as a young kid i was obsessed with listening to music yeah. i remember like you know five or six years old my two older brothers were into prince and i became okay. obsessed with prince as yeah a, six-year-old which is just like unexpected and so so uh, yeah I felt different I definitely felt different from other kids at school because I was this like yeah but you need to hear this music and they're like what are you talking about I'm listening to I don't know Craig McLaughlin on the yeah, radio. Yeah, absolutely. I'm like, but, I'm I'm like, but, but, but yeah, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not disrespectful to that song, but relative to the other stuff yeah. I was listening to, I was like, am I just not? Am I in a different place here when it comes to music? Yeah, yeah. And not in a snobbish way, but more just like I was just not listening to the stuff other people were really listening to. I appreciate it because I do appreciate a good pop song. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I think. I found a bunch of mates who live locally or it was a mate who live around the corner and he was like, Oh, I play guitar. Do you want to have a little practice? And I was like, yeah, well, I play drums. Let's do it. And we went to the same school. Then he invited his mates from like, they were into cricket and he said, Oh, a couple of my mates are guitarists as well. Maybe we could like hang out. And and then we were like, we were gigging at 15. It was crazy. What an excellent experience. It was, but we, we had no idea what we were doing though. So we even went to a studio at 15 paid some guy to tape we were recording to tape back then perfect which is which was incredible and we had yeah we recorded and we got these cassettes printed we got our own we did our own artwork yeah but this gig was this this gig venue it was a place called mr smith's in bournemouth and it doesn't exist anymore like like a classic don't look for it um like the um but the we didn't really know what we were doing but we just loved performing and and all our mates would come it was back in those days underage drinking of course yep, yep. the drinking culture was quite big back then um and everyone would just party and we would just bring people together so we were like this is amazing wow yeah, yeah. like i'm a total geek and these people are coming to see us play and, and they think we're cool yeah <laughs> like, and you so, feel and, part of something don't you <laughs> yeah and we we part of a collective little, we've we definitely were we, we were part of a scene, a proper scene. Loads of other bands who are two or three, four years older than us, we looked up to them, we were gigging with them. Yeah, They were like, oh, you guys are doing great considering your age. And it was just a scene. It was a community of people that just love listening to music and playing music and just having a good time. And, yeah. Yeah. and that's really where it came from, was the, the buzz of performing and realising, wow, you can you can connect with an audience in this way and they can have a good time and you have a good time off the back of it. Yeah. Um, it's not to say it wasn't hard work. It really was. And yeah, we always have bust ups in the band and there was a lot of ego as you're in your, you know, your teens and yeah. still trying to discover yourself anyway. And it, it was, yeah, just, just that excitement of, ah, oh, we're going to do a gig. But I had no intentions. I remember when it was the bassist uh, in the band called Chris, who's now right. a really successful music promoter. Wow. He was always going to do really well, uh, um, perhaps not as a performer, but in the but industry. Pro- yeah, yeah. Um, he always said, like, let's do a gig. And, and I was like, huh? What? I thought we were just <laughs> practicing in my mum and dad's spare yeah, room. It was just a lot. Like, yeah. Was yeah. Like, and he was like, I was like, gig? What, what would that involve? But he was the guy who put us out there. He promoted us and got us in front of people and, 
um i guess if it wasn't for him then you know maybe it would have been a different different that journey but that early work that, experience for him yeah yeah around. it was yeah little little did we know he'd, he'd set up a very successful promotion business oh wow uh, so yeah so um yeah it really was uh coming back to your original question uh just the joy of performing yeah uh, it took me a while to discover it and i think i ended up a much while i do like studio work and i like yeah. that experience um I, I prefer performing um, yeah but yeah kind of the the, <laughs> the practice and hard graph that goes with it I don't know if I could do that again. It's the it bloody. Of, it's it the, oh, of hard work. If you're headlining, it's your kit that's being used, and yeah. Um, yeah. All that it's stuff. lugging it in and all this kind of jazz. You know, it's and there's always times I always say to myself, or usually say aloud to everybody else, I'm playing with. I should have stuck to the harmonica. <laughs> Take out your <laughs> nice. pocket and start yeah, playing. Yeah. Not ever played the harmonica. Just... I'd love to, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's that kind of thing. It's hard being a drummer, folks. You go into a gig and there's. You go into a venue, it's two floors up and there's no lift and it's an old <laughs> rickety, old fire yeah. escape then. Classic. Every time it's like, ah, oh, the drummer's got the tough gig. Saying that though, the, our bassist at the time, this is a school band, he had this huge double cab. I don't know why he had it. He didn't need it. It was just oh, ridiculous. Wow. <laughs> We'd always end up carrying this thing. I'm like, I just carried my kit and my equipment. I'm carrying this thing as well. And it was so unnecessary. The, the, the small venues that we were playing in, you didn't need it. it just, I think it was just more for, yeah, yeah, it really was. I think it was just more for show because it looked cool. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, one thing that struck me when I was on the InstaWeb um, to months back a few yeah more than, more than a month now uh, and, I, and we discovered each other was there's two words in your title of your instagram account that um sang right true to me it was drums obviously and, and my thumbs disappearing as magic oh, there is, it is. Is <laughs> drums and the the well-being side of things as well it's mm. a double thumb there oh no thumb and a half there we go there's a proper thumb now um <laughs> So I'm interested to hear about the where, where does the well-being aspect come into all as well, Simon? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so probably I don't know. I'd say maybe seven, seven or eight years ago, uh, it started to get into mindfulness and meditation mm-hmm. and and just trying to understand my head a bit more. Um, yeah, understand my emotions, understand my feelings. Yeah. Uh, I've kind of had three three pretty traumatic moments in my life that, okay. that are all, all unrelated, um, but are all full on trauma experiences. So that was my way of like trying to explore well, how can I deal with these situations uh, or with these things that have happened to me, just curious about mental awareness and, and oh, can it help me? Can it mm. support me in sort of difficult times, difficult thoughts and feelings? Um so yeah, it really came from that, and I think the the drums for well being. I had a realization that I hadn't been drumming for so long. Like I'd given up when the band, the, the band that did moderately well, mm. we all like it all got pretty heated, and we left like classic band explosion. Yeah, you know, it was yeah, all too yeah. intense, and we all had to leave each other. And all exactly. that stuff. Just smashed up the hotel like, room. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. I didn't quite do that, but let's pretend we did. Yeah. Um, but I, I was like, oh, I'm not performing again. I'm done with this. You know, I'm going to raise the family. And we just had a kid at that point, our first kid. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I'm done. I'm done creating music. I, I'm going to hang up my sticks. Uh, maybe I'll come back to it. Yeah. Which at the time felt like such a huge relief. I, it was so intense. It was mm-hmm. so full on. It took up my whole life as well as a day job. Mm-hmm. Um, but I realized over time that I'd lost my identity, that I, I am a drummer. And, mm-hmm. and I'm proud of that. And I always will be and always have been. So to to have this sort of maybe eight year period where I wasn't drumming at all. Yeah. I felt like I'd lost myself, like lost a part of my my being, my yeah. my well-being, my life. Um, so randomly I got in, back into drumming. I found a local open mic night and just oh, wow. up by, by myself. Uh just to check out the scene, loads of random musicians would go up, do three songs each. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I should try and, you know, chat to a few people here, see if they yeah, need drummer yeah. just to do some backing. But at the end of the night, I didn't know they were they were running a free-for-all. <laughs> it's just everyone piles up on stage, grabs an instrument. I'm like, I'm getting on that drum kit. Cool, yeah. So, so 
I got up on there. I'm like, oh my God, I had a few beers. I'm by myself. I'm behind a drum kit. There's other musicians starting to play. They're looking at me to do something. I'm like, okay. And I just started a beat. Yeah. <laughs> and and wow. it was amazing. And instantly I was like, oh my God, I need to get back into oh, this. I really need brilliant. to get back into this. So, so I kept going back and, you know, part of the little community there now. Mm. Uh, I still just randomly turn up at the end. Um, although I've met met someone recently, a, a new neighbour who who's up for the two of us going up oh, on wow. stage and actually booking a slot. So we're going to do that. Um, Excellent. So that was kind of my way back into it. And then treat myself to the, the Roland FAD 503, as you can see. At the, in the time, I notice here. it, yeah. Yeah, that's it. And I just thought, I've, I've got to get back into this. And, and the practicalities of, we've moved recently to a, a bigger place. Right. Um, the fact that it's, you know, it's electronic, well, looks acoustic, but is it electronic? Headphones on, yeah. just play. I work from home, so on my lunch breaks, so I can just get on my kit. Brilliant. Just slippers on. And just, yeah, exactly that. <laughs> We've seen on the video of my slippers. Yeah. So it, it's, I'm a slippers it was, wearer. Shout out to all the slippers wearers, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and, it, and, it's, and it's 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 just really the well-being there comes from just you know things can be busy at work or yeah. life is hectic and family life is full-on or just you're like ah, oh, just in a bit of a funk and then i just know when i get on the kit mm-hmm. my mind goes to a place where i don't forget it all because i don't think it's about that but my relationship with those thoughts changes because yeah. i'm so focused on just let's just get into a groove let's put a backing track on or just drum for it or this is some music and try and follow along mm-hmm. and just kind of losing myself in that for a moment um just to sort of reset my head and it, yeah. and it works every time and i'm like it's like the kit is my home the kit is my mm. safe space the mm. kit is the place i know i can go to if things are tough like i'm really struggling with some difficult thoughts or feelings or you know feeling overwhelmed about things i know i can get on that kit and it will sort me out and it yeah. does <laughs> so it, it I, really... I, so is i'm drumming for my well-being essentially um yeah, yeah. And i don't think you know i don't think it's a point where i have to rely on it because i'm learning other techniques and stuff through meditation mm-hmm. and, and you know due to get some uh some therapy very soon oh great so i know i will get other other types of tools and techniques from that stuff yeah yet this is one of those tools and techniques um but i try not to treat it like that because it sort of sounds slightly dependent i just the, the the truth is i just get joy from playing drums that's, that's, that's it, it. That, the be all end of it, it really is yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's your escapism it's your safe space and it's yeah, not too far from the house, <laughs> you know. It's not <laughs> yeah, an hour drive. It's straight upstairs yeah. or whatever kind of thing, you know, or or yeah. through the wall. I, th- I think we all, you know, as as parents, I guess, because you know, um, you you've got just the one child or two, uh, two kids. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we've both, yeah, we've both got two kids, and um, yeah, I, I said this to someone the other day. Actually, is that you do need your own space. To some people go play yeah. golf. Well, not in this weather, with six foot of snow. Um, <laughs> yeah, some yeah. play golf. Some go and play chess. Some go play snooker or or, or whatever. And and some the real people drum. <laughs> and we all got to find a space <laughs> to drum. And great. The, the best thing about acoustic kits, I I struggle with acoustic kits. Perhaps not your one because I've never actually played an acoustic. Sorry, an electric. I've never played an electronic kit that looks like a drum kit. Mm. If you know what I mean. So it doesn't yeah, have the yeah. shells. It doesn't have the. Well, that's definitely the snare rather than a flat, a two-inch wide bit of plastic. Mm. Um, so I've never really used it. I'm dying to, um, Roland, if you're watching. <laughs> um, I'd die to just try out some V-drums just to see what they're like. Uh, I was talking to a company, a company in the States called E-Drum um, mm. a few weeks back, and similar to Roland, what they're doing with their with the V-drums is they look like the real deal. I'm like, wow, these look absolutely amazing. Well, the, the the crazy thing is, is I was like, I wasn't, I was sceptical because mm-hmm. I'm like, I've always played acoustic Um and and to to go on these pads, I'm like, no way, because my brain is going to tell me this is not a drum kit. Yeah. Honestly, behind that kit is just your brain. My brain just switches, and I'm like, I'm behind a kit, and yeah, you know the, the volume is up enough that I'm not hearing my tapping. I'm purely hearing a drum strike, and and the sensitivity is just mesmerizing. The, yeah. 
you know your your velocity or your weight that you and play. you still get that that bounce off the ah, off the skin, it, don't you? you still on, get that. Honestly, it honestly feels like playing an acoustic kit. It's wow. it, it's it genuinely tricks my mind every time. And I'm and I'm now back on an acoustic kit. I've I've recently reconnected with um, my brother who who uh, and with some of his mates. We're now jamming randomly Great. every sort of month or so. Yeah. So I'm back on acoustic there and I'm like, when I play the acoustic, I'm like, oh, this is great fun. But then when I get back to that, I'm like, there's no disappointment. There's no change Good. of, oh, back on my electronic yeah, I'm like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, this is great. This is yeah. just, you know, the symbols take a while to get used to, but still, they still, for real, they still bounce. They still move. Yeah. Like, there's that, you know, that play in them, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. They don't vibrate like uh, metal would, but, but they do still feel responsive. And they sound it, honestly, the exact same as well. Honestly, if people get an opportunity um, to get to get hold of the the Roland VAD five hundred three, yeah. it's magic. It's absolute magic. And kit. in the meantime, they go into your Instagram page and watch, listen to your because of the, listening to the kit, it's like as I say, the first time I saw it and I read the description, I didn't see the electronic part though, and I thought that's that's an acoustic kit. And then I thought, the lucky bugger playing the acoustic kit in your house. Because, you know, yeah, you must live in, it looks like I don't know, middle of the Cotswolds or somewhere. I don't know, but, you know, yeah. middle of the countryside where yeah. no one bothers you. Um, but then I read again, and I'm like, ah, okay, it is an e-kit. And through our conversations, like, yes, it is an e-kit. Um, so I'm dying to get my hands on um, e-kits, just to see the comparison between acoustic yeah. and, and e-kits. And as you say, it's very much like for like these days, because you're still getting... The feel of a it's a wooden tom, a wooden floor tom there, and you're still mm. it just it's amazing. The fin- and the finish is lovely as well. It's got this sparkling black wrap on it, and there's you know there's oh, no wow. choice of colours or any of that custom stuff, but yeah. it just looks beautiful. And I you know I love the I love yeah you know, we're drum geeks. We love looking at drum kits, right, and and how they're all configured. But I'm I'm very much have been a five piece player to then yeah. just a four piece. Just keep it as simple as basic, you know. Yeah. Three symbols max and hat, uh, you know, one one set of hats, of course, yeah. and, and just to simple. So, so when I saw this configuration where it is a four piece, I'm like, that's perfect because that's my yeah. kit. Oh, you need the same yep. as same as my acoustic. I don't don't need anything else. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, less is more in my opinion when it comes to drumming. So it was like, uh, yeah, it really was a match made in heaven. I was like so fortunate just with us moving place and then yeah, just going. You know what? I made a bit of cash. Life is too short. Let's my just mental, do it. mental well-being. And it was my wife said to me, she goes, Look, Simon, oh, why wow. are you even hesitating? Just freaking go for it, right? Just she goes, You haven't been driving for so long. You yeah, know, you, that's sure. you. Like that's your thing. It's like it's like taking a part of yourself away, put it back in, just go for it. We've got the space now. Yeah. Just go for it. And I was like, Yeah, I'm just gonna go for it. <laughs> and I did. You know, so, I think we've never, all I think we've all learned like, in the last <laughs> couple of years that life is far too short you know we've been stuck Indeed. at home um, whether we work at home or not but we're stuck at home with a thing called yeah. Covid in the last couple of years and um, certainly that's affected a lot of people's mental health and, and their well-being so to have mm. the kit in your house when you are stuck indoors and you can't go anywhere to the shop or, or whatever in, or, mm. or a studio or, or whatever, you've got the, the you've got your e-kit there just to kind of zone out and just that's my space. You Absolutely. Know. Um, yeah, yeah. There's a great term called cognitive musicality. Ah, okay. Um, and it was from a professor up in Dundee University called Suzanne Zicek, um, Canadian woman, amazing woman, uh, I was talking to quite a few years ago. And she, yeah, so she, this is the first time I'd ever heard the, heard the term cognitive musicality. So mm. it basically when you're playing music or listening to music, there's a little, somewhere in the brain, that's kind of triggers like, ooh, and it's your, your cognitive part of thinking, your playing, and it's just, everything's just firing at a thousand miles and hour kind of thing, you know? Uh, mm. Cognitive musicality. The the powers of music, especially when, as males, I think we're getting better now, um, with the likes of social media and everything like that, about talking about our mental health. Mm. Yeah, um, and I always think that as long as we bring the, if we bring a vehicle together, you know, where it could be go with your mate to go and play pool or golf or sit and watch a well-known TV programme together or whatever, you're in the same space and it's a safe space. 
to talk about your mental health and well-being. Um, you know, statistically, men suffering with mental health. Again, there's the word suffering. Living with mental yeah. health on a daily basis, yeah, a daily basis, struggling. Yeah, not being able to put one foot in front of another some days, mm. and to to find the music as you're kind of, you know, without getting too over over the top, like, like your saviour, if you like, you know. I, yeah, I've spoken I, to I, a few people in the past and have said, I found music in that. Was people, like people say they found God, they found football, they found, you know, music is their, is, it's kind of saved them, you know, because yeah. it takes them to a different place and allows them to sit behind the drum kit or pick up a guitar and just go into that, into that place where it's just let the brain do its yeah. thing. So earlier on today, I was reviewing a video uh, of Simon Phillips and one of a band he plays. He's in a progressive band called uh, the, Proto the, Proto the Protocol Four. They're an instrumental band uh, and they're phenomenal. It was a track called Nimbus that I was um, speaking about earlier on today. And just what we were speaking about when you're drumming or you're playing the guitar or whatever you're doing and you're in your own space. I'm just watching every single musician in that as a, as a studio surround setting, and he's locked in the bass player, guitarist, keys. They're all locked into their own little world, and into the groove, and their their eyes are closed, and they're feeling it. Mm. And just by watching that, I was like, "Wow!" It just it was one of the videos where I actually don't talk much, which people are very glad to hear. <laughs> uh, mm. <laughs> so, and it just blew me away and it makes me feel like that when I go and sit by my drum kit it's my space and I can do I can go to a different world completely different planet and can forget about stuff for however long I'm there for and I've, but I've been watching you and I can see that I can see yeah. that with you just you're focused into the groove with your slippers on and <laughs> hey I've got my slippers on just now <laughs> shout out to the slipper wearing dad let's rock yeah, the moccasin Rock, rock the Mock is in there an album rock, title for rock you. The, rock the Mock. I rock like the it. Mock. <laughs> Coming to a bar near you. <laughs> no one it's ever better take that title. Um, that's a great name. Uh, yeah, is, is your comfort when you're in your own space and you're in your own zone and you're, you've zoned out, you know? Yeah. And, it, and it, it's, it is like therapy. It is like medication. It's, mm. it's I wouldn't say it's, it was instant, but certainly... You do lose yourself in a place sometimes, you know. You really, really do lose yourself in a place when you when you're behind the drum kit. I to totally agree with we agree with that entirely. It's like I, I try and the way you describe that, I try and relate it to what I've learned with sort of mindfulness and meditation. Where mm -hmm. you know, it, I guess from my experience, I've, I've been learning about it's, it's not necessarily like ignoring the thoughts and feelings or shutting them out and saying they're not existing like i don't have to think this way it's more like just having an awareness of them that they're there and they're just letting them pass yeah, so i think what yeah. being behind the kit does or certainly has for me is I, my my brain isn't occupied with all those difficult thoughts or feelings that i may be having it's not i'm blocking them out with drumming it's more that i'm just like mm. i've just stepped away from them and I'm going, oh, I'm just, I'm focusing on drumming now. Yeah. So I'm literally, yeah. that focus getting, as you say, getting lost in it um, helps. It, 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 it basically kind of steps me back from it all and puts things into a little bit more perspective without me sort of saying, oh, I'm now putting things into perspective. It yeah, absolutely. Sort of yeah, ab so I think yeah, when we start yeah. analysing it, then we're like, oh no, we're losing the joy. And like, yeah, we're losing what's going on in here. Absolutely, we're blowing our minds. Just, just enjoy, enjoy yeah. what you're doing. It, it, it's really refreshing hearing another male um, talking about like, like the word feelings, a lot of people have got a, a, a hatred towards that word. I've not. I, we all feel things, so absolutely. we'll feel absolutely angry. We feel pissed off. We feel happy. Yeah. We feel down. Yeah, we feel yeah. depressed. We feel this, that, and other. You know, we do what we do. They're amazing yeah. drummers. Uh, we we do what we do, and that's drum. That's make noise and stick swipe and hit bits of lemon plastic or whatever or wood or whatever to, to make us feel yeah. better and you know what it's okay there's nothing wrong with that yeah yeah absolutely it's as absolutely. simple as that really isn't it it, it really is I, I feel like you know and i think society tends to be getting in a better direction certainly with the next generations i agree of, yeah 
of boys and girls openly speaking about their feelings and just kind of saying, oh, I'm feeling angry now and this is what I think I need to do about it to help deal with feeling yeah. anger instead of just going, just destroying stuff because there's no other way of dealing with it, for example. Yeah. Um, and kind of, yeah, just knowing that, that kids can hopefully you know they may not be able to articulate how they're feeling they may express it in a certain way yeah yeah Yeah, as adults if we can kind of ask certain questions um and acknowledge when there's certain thoughts and feelings and remind them that it's okay to feel that way it's okay to you know you're feeling angry that's that's okay just you know be aware of it and all that stuff Mm -hmm. so i i kind of feel uh the next generations are, are certainly in a better position yet i can still absolutely see for any future generation that performing as a musician will help yeah it it will just help whether it's someone expressing themselves where they can't articulate it um verbally and they want to write it in their music and their lyrics Mm -hmm. or just in their composition of whatever instrument they're playing um i think that will always be i always feel that will be a constant um, yeah regardless of what genre those people are playing, yeah, regardless of how genres evolve, how te- music technology evolves, I think the essence of what music can do for people as an individual, as a small group of people, as a band performing and to a wider audience, yeah. I think I think that won't change. And I'd like, I'd like, you know, I'm slightly worried about lack of gigging. And, you know, I talked earlier on about the joy I had from being a 15-year-old kid performing in front of a load of mates. Uh, and, and people going to gigs I feel that's a slight worry that people no longer go to gigs and go yeah. to these venues because they're shutting down and the dynamics changed and got social media telling us what to watch and listen to and people mm-hmm. aren't getting yep. into albums and music or they're just kind of getting 10 seconds of something and throwing it away I'm slightly worried about that but the essence of people performing as individuals as a group and to an audience I think will will remain yeah, constant yeah. that it will have a positive mental effect on people it has to it really has to you know yeah. you listen to some famous musicians out there and they've gone through trauma uh on in a variety of different ways and they've kind of fell out of music for a while because they're they're mm. grieving or they're they're dealing with something else that life's thrown at them and they've disappeared off the face of the earth in the public eye uh, for a year or two or whatever it may be. And they're like, oh, they're back. And they've never actually gone away. They're always there. Mm. But the, how I would describe it is they fell out with their instrument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they lost, they lost that relationship with their instrument. Because I've not drummed for years until the last five years. I would say five, yeah. I, I, I hadn't drummed for like five years prior to the last five years. Um, mm. So, I know that feeling of um, probably because I've got loads of guitars in my house. I always pick up guitars anyway. And it's the whole physicality of having a drum kit in your house or whatever. And you don't have to have a drum kit in your house to practice, obviously. But um, yeah, losing that relationship with something that you love mm. and not being able I think I think fighting that is the worst thing you can do. Yeah. Because you get even worse. Yeah. And you, you feel worse and you feel even worse. And at the time, you don't think that. You're like, I just want to drum, but I can't, and this, that, and other. And, but life has thrown me this curveball, and it's, it's a pain in the ass, and wow. But then I think the world moves in the right way. I think it, you always find, the drums always find you, or you yeah, always find the yeah. drums, whether it be selling a house, making a bit of money, moving to a bigger house, you've got a wee bit of extra cash, you know what, I'm going to buy a roll and peek it. You know, to get yeah. that because without you selling the house you probably wouldn't have got that you know no, you know what i mean so no, absolutely it, not it would whatever have, things never are, happen whatever <laughs> thing, <laughs> things are thrown, thrown at you then that's uh that's the thing we spoke about um young people and how things may be changing with them lack of seeing you know them going, lack of live concerts or the accessibility to live concerts because tickets are so expensive i yeah. went to see um we are going to see Ozzy Osbourne three or four years ago in Glasgow and an amazing venue um, and it was great fun um, but wow tickets are so expensive so so expensive and I, and I think that could be I'm not going to speak about cost of living but I think that could be 
a thing where folk don't want to they, or they can't go to live gigs. You know, Absolutely. it's great. I, I always love going to a local pub or a pub in town in Edinburgh and in the grass market, for example, and there's a band playing great. Let's just listen to them and have a have a great time and have a couple of beers and watch them. I think that's the best kind of night. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'd love to, mean. you know, I'd love to go and see Queen and Adam Lambert, but I can't bring myself to pay eighty ninety pound for a ticket up in the, up in the gods, you know, up in the yeah. top of the hydro or the O two in London or whatever it may be, you know, because I want to be, I want to be there. I want to, you yeah. know, I want to smell them and feel them. You know, I want to feel that. Yeah, yeah, that, that aspect from the stage, you know. But um, you do yeah, wonder if there's there's some sort of I don't know future where it does rely on some sort of scholarship fund f- to get young kids going back to gigs because i think if they don't like i would go to gigs when i was a kid and i'd see bands and that would inspire me to go and play yeah. and be like ah oh, we could be better than them or, or yeah. we could be as good as them or would it be amazing if we ended up supporting them this was in the small community of mus- musos in bournemouth that I, mm-hmm. I talked about earlier on I think had I not seen them, I wouldn't have been inspired. I'm, I, you know, I was still obsessed with music. And yeah. I, you know, there was no, I wasn't watching, there was no YouTube. Maybe my dad had a few cassettes of some live performances, yeah. but if I wasn't watching people, live stuff. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, and I, so I, I think, you know, kids missing out on that opportunity yeah. to see live performances, I yeah. think, has an effect on their, you know, their potential to become musicians and to really get joy from playing instruments in a way that's not like they've been forced to learn it because school taught them yeah. to do it or their parents have said you've got on piano and they're reluctantly like mm. oh, i don't want to it's mm. that it's that kind of joy of naturally discovering stuff that i think creates musicians who really want to do it who really yeah. are excited by it uh, and i think that also comes from going to gigs um yeah i funny enough i just remembered the first ever gig i went to was Billy Ocean. <laughs> so, Billy Ocean, so when, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. This is when the, now, is that at the Bournemouth stuff, International Centre? It, it was at the Bournemouth International Centre. That, that is good knowledge. Right. And I went with my family, my two older brothers, my mum and my dad, um, and Billy Ocean was on stage. And I was like, my mind was blown. Wow. I must have been like six or something. Yeah. I was like, this it's is a huge, what is famous this? guy. Yeah. What is this? This is insane. I was like, I want to be doing this. And, it, and, I, and I don't, you know, Again, it's that experience of the physicality of I was in this room and everyone was knew the words. I was like, yeah, I know these words because we listen to this music at home. And now Absolutely. I know it. But they're singing it at me. It's really weird. And now I can sing it back and everyone else is singing back. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, as a kid, you're like, what is this? Wow. Thing? It blows your um, mind. It really does blow totally your mind. It totally did. And I, and I, you know, I, I, you know we, we take our kids, kids to gigs and we, we surround them around music because yeah. I know what joy and my wife enjoys singing and she loves music as well. Oh, wow. Um, so it's like kind of, uh, we know what joy can bring people. So, yeah, yeah. trying to yeah, encourage kids to get into gigs, I think is super important. And yeah. I wonder if because of it's so expensive, as you said, as you've pointed out, that there's something about some scholarship, whether that comes from, you know, local councils, government or musicians themselves or some other body that's set up that yeah. can actually have money put aside to to you know discount ticket pricing or to give stuff away um to allow young kids to get to gigs i, yeah. I think that would be wonderful I, i'm not aware of anything that exists about that but maybe i need to look into it yeah it's certainly something for something to look into um and certainly if someone is watching this and they know something about it they let me know uh, let us both yeah. know um because yeah, simon's details or his instagram will be on the comments below but um finally finally what advice would you give to a, say a drummer in this case um who approaches you in the street say hi simon i am seven years old and i really fancy getting into drumming what's the first kind of bit of advice you would tell them uh play with other musicians find find a buddy because mm-hmm. i i think had I have stayed solo, I don't think I would have had the experience that I fortunately had in my life as a drummer. I was very fortunate to find a mate who played guitar and we're like, mm. oh, let's play. And we just, we bounced off each other, that camaraderie. And he invited his mate who invited his mate and just the the different perspectives on things. Yeah. And, and, and 
you know, I think if I went back and did it again, I'd try and play in more bands. I've played in quite a few bands, but play in more different genres yeah. as early as possible just to find like what I enjoy and what my technique leans towards. So yeah, find finding other musicians to play with who share a passion for music as much as you do. Um, and just learn from them, learn and listen. Yeah. Um, I think I'd also say just keep it steady and don't show off. <laughs> It depends what style of band you're in. That's if one of the best advice band. I was ever told a few years back is, David, just yeah. stop trying to show off yeah. and just play, play straight, Keep just play straight for or whatever. Yeah. Because Get it in the if, back. Yeah, exactly, because you're not coming back. Because uh, if you screw up, you look, people are going to notice oh, you before they notice people, anybody else screwing up. People notice a band with a bad drummer more than they they want to admit because a non-muso, and I don't mean this in an arrogant way, but a non-muso who just turns up to a gig to hear music, they'd be like, yeah, the band weren't good. And mm. maybe they can't pinpoint it, but yeah. if you and I are in that room, we'd be like, yeah, the drummer was terrible. <laughs> like, Absolutely. Not that we would say that because we want to encourage the yeah, person yeah, yeah, and help yeah. them. But you'd be certainly but, thinking... But we'd be mm. thinking, oh, wow, it's a shame because the drummer let the whole band down. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, keep keep it steady. Yeah, absolutely. Steady and slow, or or fast, whatever you're kind of rather you want to go. But certainly, I yeah. keep it steady and uh, on time. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Simon, thank you very very much. Um, it's, we're doing actually well, folks. Cause it's late on a Friday night where most folk would be socialising. It's the week before. It's the sixteenth of December. It's the week before weekend, almost before Christmas, and people would be out. Um, having fun in games and you and I are talking to each other having even more fun so that's Absolutely. the main thing I'm so glad that we uh, we kind of touched base with each other a few weeks ago Simon and we managed to find time to slot into our busy family work schedules um, to try and get this done um, but is it, all your Instagram details will be on the uh, link below listen matey thank you so much for your time it's been an absolute Likewise. blast it's good to talk about drums on a Friday night isn't it yeah, absolutely. I could talk about drums on a Friday night for the whole night. So, David, exactly. I'm, I'm really, yeah, really grateful that you reached out and uh, we're up for a chat. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been an absolute pleasure. And yeah, let's stay in touch. Keep, Any, keep yeah, absolutely. Alive. Absolutely. It's, um, I've always wanted to go to a drum show and they're always down in England. They're never, ah, there you go. well, the big ones are in England. So, I think the next one next year is in Liverpool. So, I'm hoping, to, oh, I think it's nice. October next year, something like that. 15th, 16th of October. It's a two day event at one of the arenas down there. So I'm I might find an excuse to get myself there as well. Well, so. yes, <laughs> certainly something that's something I want to work on between now and then is building up a little yeah. community uh, on here and Brilliant. meeting up down there and having having good luck. It's quite cheap as well. We're talking about tickets to go to venues. It's something like £15 for a, the weekend. Or, oh, wow. It's, nice. Yeah, it blew my mind when I saw that. So anyway, anyway, I do digress. Simon, thank you so, so much for your time. And well, uh, David, take care. And have a great Christmas, okay? You too. Take care. Take care. All the best. Bye. 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 Bye.